Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I have a very special guest. I say that almost every time, but if if I was thinking of a a client and a friend that I would want to be like, I mean, this next guest is just someone I he's what we say the same on stage and off stage. He is authentic and he wrote the book, The Gift of Struggle. He's founder and CEO of a great organization, The Populist Group, and he has created an amazing culture there. And uh, yet just a, a humble, brilliant, kind. I'm just, I'm just, I'm grateful you're here. Thanks for being with us, Bobby Herrera. Yeah. God bless you, David. What kind <laughs> words. I feel the same. I feel the same. I was really looking forward to seeing you today. Yeah, I I'm just grateful and and uh, this is going to be fun and people are going to get a lot out of our time together too, uh, because you're here. So, Bobby grew up, thirteen kids in his family and grew up with not much financially. In fact, didn't feel like you could you could. Uh, uh, you know, even afford to to buy meals when your sports team was, <laughs> went out and all those kind of things. But you had a moment. I think it's interesting for people. I'm going to recommend it. Everybody will see it in the show notes. Uh, there's other ways to connect with Bobby. If you want to work at an amazing culture, you know, consider Populous Group if they have space. But I think uh, I think the book, The Gift of Struggle, you know, we, we avoid struggle. And uh, I want to talk about that book overall, but let's go back to that moment when you're 17 years old and and just share that kind of, it seemed to give some meaning and mission to life. A marker moment for me, David. Uh, yeah, I was uh, a kid that was introduced to struggle from day one. Uh, I'm one of 11. I still eat with my elbows on the table. I will steal your bacon from you in a fraction of a second. Uh but, you know, this moment, uh, I was 17 and my brother, Ed, and I, we were on a return trip home from a basketball game. And along the way, we stopped for dinner. And when we stopped, everyone unloaded off the bus, except for my brother, Ed, and I. You know, at that point in my family's story, we, we didn't have the means to play sports and afford dinner. And it's just the way things were. Well, a few moments after the team unloaded, one of the dads of the other players steps on board the bus. And he teased me a little bit because Ed had outscored me that night. And then he said something to me, David, that I'll always remember. Bobby, it would make me very happy if you would allow me to buy you and Ed dinner so that you can join the rest of the team. Nobody else has to know. All you have to do to thank me is do the same thing for another great kid like you in the future. And uh, I'll always remember how I felt in that moment because, you know, I'm 17. I had no idea what I want to do with my life. I just know that I wanted my future to look different than my past. And uh, I remember stepping off the bus that evening, David, and uh, all I had in front of me was a desire to, you know, raise my hand and join the army, which I eventually did. But other than that, I had no, no clue what I wanted to do. And, um, uh, but I do remember very vividly that night that although I didn't know what I wanted to do, I knew why. I wanted to figure out a way to create something that would allow me to pay forward that kind act to other kids like me who were born on the wrong side of the opportunity divide. And it was a transformative moment for me. Uh, the compassion and the humility that this dad that stepped on board the bus demonstrated for me um, just changed my outlook on so many things. And it really gave me hope that I desperately needed at that point in my life. And it just helped me rethink my story and reframe my story. And that led to many other wonderful uh, opportunities to you know, just become the person that I wanted to. And that, you know, obviously that's a quest and a journey we're all on, but um, I'll, I'll never forget that evening. It, it changed my life forever. You've been on a journey that's been amazing. Now, leader of a great organization, and you know, dad, 
to some amazing kids and your 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 uh, relationship with your wife Rosalind and I just just who you are. I just um um I think there's some just greatness there. We're going to come around to um those three questions you ask in the book, but I want to just what else what kind of led to you writing the book? Yeah, you know, it wasn't on my list. Um you know, I, I, I sat next to really smart guys like you to get through college, David. So I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't, you know, more of a storyteller than a writer and, you know, through some encouragement, uh, you know, I did a lot of storytelling for kids. Uh, you know, I call them my fellow underdogs and, uh, veteran entrepreneurs and so forth. And through that journey, I kept getting some nods of encouragement. It's like, Hey, you have to put some of these stories in a book. You know, you have to put some of these simple principles and leadership lessons in a book. And, you know, I finally uh, decided to do it. And when I, when I finally did, I, I just had a couple of very simple uh, objectives for it. Number one, I wrote it to give, you know, I want to write the book that I wish someone would have written for me. And two, um, I've always had a real simple mantra when I tell a story is like, I call it just one. I said, if it helps just one person take better control of their story. It's a massive success. And, uh, I've been blessed that, uh, I I've been able to do both of those with that. And, um, <clears throat> it was part of that journey encouragement from really good people that said, Hey, you, you, you need to share this story. And, uh, I'm really happy that I did now, but I was pretty reluctant for a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just cause I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, pretty, you know, behind the scenes kind of guy. I live on a farm and, you know, you and I've talked a lot about that. I, I prefer to stay in the background. Yeah. And yet you're leading. I think uh, we, I want to talk about leadership and your culture at Populous Group and some of that. But before mm -hmm. I do, I want to go a little deeper on the book. I want to just touch on three of the key questions and, and you just respond to them, just kind of give a little life to them for a minute, sure. maybe. You know, the first one is, who are you becoming? I love the mountains and I'm passionate about the mountains. And I believe that every single one of us, and so I use it as a metaphor in many things. I have a cold climbing thing with my culture. And, you know, I believe that we're all climbing our own mountain. Like there's a place that we imagine that looks and feels better than where we are today. And we all share basic desires to stand out, to fit in, and to be a part of something bigger in ourselves. And that's part of that climb that we're on. And, you know, asking ourselves that simple question, who am I becoming? And, you know, self-assessing that consistently and simply uh, I believe is profound because, you know, leadership obviously starts with that goodness that we all have inside. We just have to dig for it. So that, so who are we becoming? We're going to consider that. Your second question is what's the invisible force that drives us? Yeah, that's a bus story for me. You know, that moment on the bus, um, one of the reasons people have often, often asked me why it had such a profound impact on me and you know, there was an interesting backstory. You know, the gentleman that stepped on board the bus, he was a very successful businessman in the community. And the narrative that I told myself at the time, David, was that, you know, people like him, they don't see kids like me. And with one kind act, not only did he teach me that I was wrong, but he taught me that one of the single most important parts of leadership is seeing and encouraging potential. And so that moment became my invisible force. It helped me understand that someday I could check what I call the ultimate box. And that is, will my story matter? Uh, and I believe we all have a, a own version of a bus story inside of us, a moment that helped give us that, that hope that, yes, someday my story could matter too. You have to dig for it though. Num number three, I could pause on each of these and be... Uh moved and thinking of my, my own, I'm processing as I have before with your work, but am I giving more than I'm taking? I think probably the best way to describe that is, uh, you know, I'm going to borrow a quote from a gentleman whose work I've studied quite a bit. Um, uh, a Jesuit priest named Anthony DeMello, uh, very, very wise, you know, spiritual and, um, uh, uh, you know, teacher of, of just, good principles. And, you know, he has a metaphor that he uses, you know, every day the sun comes out and it shines and not once does a sun ever say to the earth, you owe me. It just gives. 
And you know, I believe that one of the single most important characteristics in leadership, and this applies to fatherhood, to friendship, is just giving more than you take. You know, because you know, when you truly give, you don't wait for a third act. You know, you give, the person receives. And too often, I believe, you know, we wait for a third act. We keep a scorecard or we want something in return. But that's not really giving. You know, our cup should be full by shining and just knowing that in giving, there are two acts, giving and receiving. And when you learn to eliminate that third act, I think that's when you're really living and appreciating the power of giving. I love that. In life, it makes some sense. How do you do that in business? I mean, you get you guys create this great product. You mm-hmm. have to get paid for it. You, right. you have certain relationships you're trying to sell, and you've got an amazing sales team. They have mm-hmm. to get sales. Like, how do we... How do we live that out in the business world? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, it's counterintuitive to uh, you know some of these important roles in the ecosystem of an organization. Um, you know, what I've encouraged my like my sales force, you know, my VP of sales, a uh, gentleman named Frank DeCastro, he's extraordinary at, at this. You know, I think when you when you give from a place of helping others and you know, you give from a place of, you know, compassion, your, you know, your second pillar of trust where you truly see others and you really want to help them solve their problem. The return's going to come. Like, I believe people genuinely, uh, when they receive that triggers a, a relationship where they, in, they too want to return it in their own way. And so if you give, at least with that mindset and with that heartfelt approach, you're going to be able to get the return that you're looking for. But you also got to be able to keep the equation, I call it, keep it unbalanced. And that's why, you know, when I sign off my emails, I do give greater than take, right? You're going to take, but just make sure that it's always unbalanced. And you do that. It's funny, it works out. You, you, you end up getting a premium for your work. You know, people appreciate that a great deal. And I believe they show it in the way, you know, like, uh, you know, like we, we, we all love great service and we're willing to pay for great service. So, you know, we do it in our own buyer behavior, but it's more of a mindset than it is a, uh, a formula. Hey, it's Anne with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true to life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. So you've been, uh, you know, I do, I do want to get to your culture of your company because I'm so thrilled about that and some of the things you've been able to do. But I do want to ask you this question. You know, it seems like at least the leaders I walk next to and walk, get to walk with because of some of the things we're doing, um, they're leading themselves well. Mm-hmm. And they have some routines, they have habits personally. Mm-hmm. What, what, uh, what are you willing to share around habits that you have personally to be the leader you can be? Yeah, hey, great question. I'm very open about uh, about some of these habits, and I do them imperfectly, but I also do my best to try to do them consistently. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a routines guy. I think that started getting wired early on as a migrant farm worker, getting up early and working, and then the army embedded that into me deeply. Um, but I always start my day uh, fueling what my spiritual pillar. So I, I, I try to live my life on four pillars. My spiritual pillar, my uh, emotional pillar, my intellectual pillar, and my physical pillar. And you know, even if you were to look on my my board here next to me, I have those four in a box, and I have a few simple things that I do underneath each of them. You know, I, I you know, like I start my day with you know the good book, and I'll read uh, a couple of scriptures, and I'll meditate on them, and. I'm big into neurotheology. You know, I believe 12 minutes of prayer a day, as has been proven, uh, can help rewire your brain. So I need that. Uh, and so I always start my day there. 
And then I'll start my day with, uh, after that, I'll go to uh, uh, what I call the, you know, emotional pillar uh, fuel. And I'll read like this morning, I actually read some stuff on Anthony DeMello. Um, and then I'll read and then I'll pick up after that. Then I'm like, okay, well, let me challenge some of my thinking and I'll, I'll read something that fuels my intellectual pillar. And then after I do that, I follow it with a, you know, a good hard workout. And, you know, I start my days really early, David. Uh, I'm the uh, early guy in the house and everybody else sleeps in. And, you know, by the time everyone else wakes up, I have all four of those boxes checked and then I can just be silly dad the rest of the day or, you know, uh, do, do my service to populist group. What's your, what, what is it? Give us a time frame. When do you normally get up? I usually wake up, uh, about, you know, in between four forty-five and five thirty. It's like, that's just the way my body works. I'm yeah. Yeah. It's I'm up, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and, uh, but on the flip side of it, once, you know, 9 PM rolls around, <laughs> I'm a sloth. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm just worthless. Yep. Uh, that's that's uh, that's i have the i'm morning more i feel are you yeah so so you know th- this is great how do you um what's a way i i, I promise everybody i'm going to get to the company leadership stuff but th- <laughs> want something here because your family's so great what are you doing to lead your kids well yeah, great question. You know, what a humbling leadership journey fatherhood is, right? You know, you know I've talked a lot offline about that. Um, you know what I've what I've learned about uh, my kids. You know, my dad had a saying in Spanish. You know, I was I was number eleven or thirteen, and I thought I was born with a single mission: try to figure out some type of mischief that your parents haven't seen before, and that's pretty hard as number eleven. Uh, and my dad's saying in Spanish was, he'd say, hijo eres, papá serás, which means a son you are, a dad you'll be. You're going to get yours. And so, uh, you know, my, my three little Mexican Vikings, they, uh, my coconuts, um, first and foremost, I try to be a spiritual leader for them uh, and, you know, model for them. You know, we're, we're big on using the, uh, you know, the fruits of the spirit to guide our behavior. You know, and so when we you know, show up or I show up or they show up in a way that isn't them, I'll, a- I'll often ask them about, like, hey, you know, buddy, you know, what, what fruit of the spirit could have helped you there? And they'll say, dad, you know, patience or dad, you know, uh, kindness, you know, and so I'll use those those, those, those fruits of the spirits, those attributes of Jesus's personality, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And I'll use that as a barometer, but I try to do it in a way to where I don't force it on them because I also don't want them to feel like I'm, uh, imposing my spiritual beliefs on them. But at the same time, allowing it to be a guide so that they can self-assess. Cause you know, my responsibility is their dad. I tell them all the time, you know, I'll ask them, Hey daddy, you know, Hey buddy, what's, what's dad, dad's job. And they'll say to prepare me for the path, not to prepare the path for me. And I'm like, you're right. You know, and you know, that comes from our passion for the mountains that we share, you know, cause I get them out in the mountains a lot. Matter of fact, we're leaving later this tonight to go uh, to the mountains in California. So I get them out in the mountains and that's where we teach each other. So let's jump to populist group. You've created quite a culture there and you've certainly been intentional about it. We met because I was speaking at an event for a big uh, medical company and you were there and presidents of our other, uh, I guess you could say med tech companies and medical companies, medical device companies were there. Uh, but tell us just a quick of what you do. And then I really, I want to get into culture mostly, but um, at populist group, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, populist group, Latin for people, you know, we're a community of egoless, passionate climbers building something bigger than ourselves. And, you know, the, the problem we solve for the world is, you know, we help organizations, primarily larger organizations, uh, mid to large, better manage their non-permanent workforce. 
you know, organizations have a pretty good grip on their full-time permanent employees. But when it comes to their non-permanent employees, contractors, foreign nationals, independent contractors, it's a big ball of yarn for them with different rules and laws across state lines. And they usually come to an organization like us and say, hey, help me untangle this. This is confusing. It's frustrating me. We want to do it right and be compliant. Can you help me? And so we help them untangle that mess and do it better, faster, more efficiently, and more economically. So tell us, you've built a culture there. You call your, you could say, some people would say employees. You call uh-huh. climbers. And you right. use that a mountain climbing uh, analogy throughout what you do. You even take them. There's an annual climb for your group. Yeah. Uh, but kind of, how many people do you have? And what do you do in these days intentionally to build uh, this, you call it the culture code at Populous Group. But tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, um, culture is, I mean, defined in so many different ways. But my very simple definition is, you know, it's like, hey, what is the personality of our organization? What is the feeling that we want people to experience when they interact with us? And it needs to answer the question, you know, how do we behave? And our culture code is uh, centered around three primary pillars. And the first one is we give more than we take, we speak from the heart, and we go off the beaten path. And all three of those pillars, David, we have stories that support the behavior that we want everyone in our community to emulate. You know, for example, the give more than you take, embedded in that is the bus story and everything we do to bring that to life you know, speak from the heart, that in its purest essence is all about building trust. It's all about uh, serving. It's all about telling the truth, being the people that, that, that we want to become. And, you know, the third going off the beaten path, that's really all about being a great listener and uh, solving problems in a creative way. And, building enough trust within the community so that these climbers can raise their hand and say, Hey, we've been doing this wrong and we need to find a better way. I mean, one of our core values is find a better way. So um, that's at the essence of our culture and our culture code. And, you know, we embed that deeply into all of the human systems and the routines and the symbols and the traditions that we have, and it's taken me, you know, we'll be uh, 19 years old in September, on September 9th. So, you know, basically, I would say we graduated high school by now, but we're just a big 10th grader because we flunked at least three times in my first 10 years building the community. Tell, tell us in your community, how, what are some traditions you have for, for building those? Yeah, you know, you mentioned the... Uh, the annual trip. Um, so every August I'll take, um, a handpicked group of climbers. And these are climbers that are first and foremost, are they live in the culture code and are they modeling our values for everyone else? And then they do those two. Then we look at the results and the performance and they do, I'll take like six to Mount Rainier and we'll, make the climb up to Camp Muir. It's an all day lesson packed journey um, that create more stories that they come back and share. Um, Another one is, you know, every year, my version of the Heisman, I call it the Sherpa award. You know, a Sherpa is a guide and, you know, you can't get up a mountain that's hard to climb without a great Sherpa. And so every year, I will select one climber in our whole community that has lived our values and our culture code better than anyone. And I give them the Sherpa. It's our version of the Heisman. I give one a year and it's not about performance. It's not a sales award. Um, and I celebrate the heck of them out of them. And we, uh, uh, and then I'll fly all of the Sherpas and the previous winners, all the previous Heisman winners per se, 
to a location, uh, a, a surprise location every every year in September, and we'll spend two days looking deep inside our culture and asking ourselves a few simple questions. What are we doing well? What do we need to do better? What do we need to change? And I give them the voice. And so I empower them to just be the voice of the community and tell me the good, bad, and the ugly along with the rest of my executive team. And it gives them a sense of, you know, being heard and, and owning the culture. And, you know, you do that over a period of years and these traditions stick. So I'm big on traditions and, and symbols and routines uh, like that. I like it. <clears throat> and, you know, David, I got, I'm going to reach over and grab this. <clears throat> on day one, everybody gets one of these. It's a carabiner. Um, and on it, it says choice. And so one of the first lessons that climbers learn when they get selected for our community is that, hey, we get to choose whether or not we ask for help, whether or not we choose to help, whether or not we share our ideas, whether or not we uh, build trust, whether or not we extend trust, all those important behaviors are embedded in our culture code. And so I expect climbers to take their carabiner to every meeting, every call that they're on as a reminder and a symbol that we climb as one. So I have these types of traditions and vernacular embedded into every part of our uh, culture. And it's just kind of a quirky way that my, my mind works. And I've just done that from the beginning. And uh, it's been very, very effective for us. Hmm. I love it. You know, many people listening, we, we, we deal with obviously culture all the time. Some of the biggest companies in the world trying to drive cultures of trust. We believe performance goes up and is at its best when there's a culture of trust. But I think some people have a lot they could learn from how do we systemize, how do we make traditions, how do we make routines? We talk about it all the sure. time. You've got to have the, the seven big components to, to transform a culture. And one of them is an ongoing reinforcement. There has to be a way. We can't be a one and done flavor of the month. We have to have a way to reinforce. And I love what you've done yeah. with that is, is, uh, is interesting. Hey everyone, and here with another quick interruption to share some big news. November 1st through the 3rd, you are invited to the Trusted Leader Summit. And if you know us even a little, you know we're big time into bringing amazing leaders together in a way that actually makes an impact in the world. We're talking about a get together that is packed with immediately useful content from speakers and leaders who've never been all in the same place at the same time. It's going to be incredible. We all want to follow and work for leaders we can trust. So get your tickets before they're gone at trustedleadersummit.com and join us in becoming even more trusted leaders. We can't wait to see you there. So I give you credit often I've, about VUCA because, uh, you know, we were talking, I think it was early on in the pandemic and and you you talk about learning VUCA. I'm going to, I'll jump in and share it because uh, I'll share my take on it sure. and then you can give life to it. But I remember you saying in the World College, you went through the World College in the 80s and you learned, we, I think we were touching base on, um, right after you read uh, wrote a blog on it, everybody should go, and we're going to put this in the show notes, bobby-herrera.com, uh, where you can go see more about Bobby Herrera and the book, uh, The Gift of Struggle, which everybody should get. I don't say that with every book I put on here, I'll tell you that right now, and also... Um, and, and and also read your blog, but you talked about how you learned. You know, you, I, if I remember it right, you were saying, you know, kind of what was working for you in the pandemic and uh, early on, and you said, well, you learned this in the in the work college. It, it, VUCA, V stands for volatility, U stands for uncertainty, C stands for complexity, and A stands for ambiguity. And as I recall it, you talked about how you know times in uncertainty, we asked especially kind of two groups of questions or two questions. And it, those that have done well, it's helped me in, in the pandemic of, number one, what can I control? And I and then, and by the way, I saw this with people. Many people spent all their brain calories on things they could not control and didn't pause right. and think what they could. And secondly, in times of uncertainty or, or, or times of VUCA, um, of those, what should I do first? and mm -hmm. then prioritizing. That made a big difference for me, and I've just got to say, your perspective on that made a big difference for a lot of those that we serve. But is there anything you would like to add to that? That's my limited perspective on a conversation that changed uh, my life and others that I coach and consult with, but 
give us give us your maybe a little extended thoughts on VUCA. Yeah, um, you know, um, it was introduced into the Army, uh, the Army War College uh, in the 80s. I learned it in the late 80s just, you know, because it was somewhat going viral when, when I was, you know, during uh, my time in service. And, um, you know, basically VUCA is a fancy acronym of saying, hey, when it hits the fan, people are going to panic. And, you know, they have all these dynamics going on. And as a leader, your responsibility in a sense, and this is what I did when the pandemic hit, is like, I need to slow the game down for my people. Because often our intuition, you know, our, our, our lizard brain takes over, the amygdala takes over, and you, you intuitively want to go faster. And so VUCA, in a sense, in the leadership uh, environment is, let me slow the game down. Let me let them breathe relax, we got this. And so by looking at the things that we can control and helping people understand that, all right, well, this is volatile. This is going to be very uncertain. This is no doubt going to get more complex. If you try to go out and get those answers on the outside, you're going to lead people to panic more. So instead it's like, no, let's look at us. Let's look at ourselves. What can we do? What can we do well? And uh, what can we control? And then let's try to do them in the best order that we can. Because sometimes you won't know until later on whether or not you did it in the right order. Let's try to figure out the best order here and take a methodical, responsible approach. That's hard to do when you know uh, there's enemy fire coming your way. And that, in a sense, is the essence of it. And it helped a lot. And I managed the temperament of the organization throughout the pandemic by using that quite a bit. It's like, okay, let's manage the VUCA. Where's the VUCA? Where's the VUCA today? How, where are people feeling the VUCA? And how are you managing it? How are you slowing the game down? And that was super helpful for my leaders. And throughout last year, they did an exceptional job of that. Um, I was real proud of them. Following that up, you know, you did something amazing that many leaders would like to do, and it shows something about your leadership that you were able to do this. But you took uh, into the pandemic a little ways. You took and basically, basically took a sabbatical mm -hmm. and left leadership of the organization in the hand of the senior leaders that you developed. You had some time that you needed or felt like you needed or felt like it was best to take away, and they stepped up. How are you able to do that? So many times that we don't trust our... That's a big extension of trust. And by the mm -hmm. way, just so everybody out there knows, I don't believe you should do that anytime just because you want to. Like we, can, yeah. we, we have to prepare the way for that to work, and somehow you did it in a way that you left and things kept running and even growing well. How, tell us about that. Yeah, you know, that was a hard decision, and it wasn't, David, in that, you know, embedded deeply in our culture is also, uh, I believe, our most important principle, and you know, it's team one is greater than team two, and I call my familia, my family, team one, and populist group, team two, and I've always been very vocal about making sure that everybody knows where my priorities are. In that, hey, I love you, populist group, but if my family's threatened in any way or form, I'm going to walk away from you in an instant. And I want you to behave the same way. And so by modeling that and creating that safety for them, you know, they it wasn't a surprise to my organization. Uh, it was a bit of a shock to my executive team when I told them, hey, I have some things happening in my family and they need me. And because I want to give you all everything that I have, I have to give everything that I have there and I'm going to need to step away. You've all been with me for a long time. You know what I expect. I'm going to test my leadership and I'm going to extend that trust to you. I actually went as far as telling them, don't email me. Don't call me unless it's an HOF call house on fire. And, uh, they respected that boundary. And I even, you know, I set it up uh, with them and I said, hey, if you all have to make a big decision and you need a tiebreaker, then, you know, uh, I appointed someone as a tiebreaker. But it was hard to do, 
but it was the right thing to do. So in a sense that made it very easy for me to, to make that call. Um, and I didn't check a single email in uh, five months that I was away. I didn't make a single call to any of them to check in. Uh, and they did a great job. And uh, one of, the, one of the, the area where I'm most proud of them, David, is you, know, you, you obviously know that trust is the only metric I care about. Um, our trust scores as an organization uh, were the highest it ever, ever, ever was. And they did it without me. And so I was really, really proud of them uh, for being able to do that. And uh, I, you know, I think it's been a very good growing experience for them. And I'm just tremendously proud of what they were able to do. Fantastic. Well, there's a whole lot more we could talk about. <laughs> Many more things um, I'd love to to dive into. I'm going to I'm, I'm just going to have to delay some of this till next time. I think uh, you know I want people to be thinking about your book, The Gift of Struggle. Next time, if we get another time, and I haven't had anybody on a second time, but I definitely would be honored to have you. I, the five questions to ask yourself yearly. I think that would be a good place to come back to, but maybe as a cliffhanger, people can go read your blog on the five things everyone should ask themselves annually. Um, we're going to put everything in the show notes that we've talked about and definitely the, the, the bobby-herrera.com and links to your book, The Gift of Struggle, and just a little bit more about you and the Populist Group. I'm so uh, grateful to know you and call you friend and so proud of you as a leader and uh, both at home and at work. You know, we always end this with one question. It's the Trusted Leader Show. Who, who's a leader you trust, Bobby, and why? Yeah, Dave, this probably isn't going to surprise you, but um, yeah, uh, my most trusted leader is, is is Jesus Christ, and just the way that He led His life, and how He served, and just what He left us to model our goodness after, and yeah, you know, that's that's the most trusted leader that I do my best to learn from, because we could never be be like that, but we can definitely learn from from Jesus Christ. Indeed. From there, where do we go? Well, <laughs> Bobby, thank you. This has been the Trusted Leader Show. Thank you so much, Mr. Bobby Herrera. Till next time, everybody, stay trusted. <laughs>